Well, coming up on today's show, Tesla tweets about snow testing. China sees some more impressive sales figures and the truck industry are given some advice. If you're not making electric trucks now, you're not late, but you're not early. Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. Hello and welcome to the Monday, the 13th of August edition of EV News Daily. It's Martin Lee here with the news you need to know about electric cars and the move towards sustainable transport will start with a Tesla tweet, whilst it's unlikely that you, or indeed I, will ever need to drive at speed on the frozen Alaskan snow, it's good to know that Tesla are covering all the bases. They've got your back, if you like. Earlier today, Tesla tweeted a short video of a Model 3 performance testing in the snow. It's obvious, but I'll say this anyway. Firstly, there's no noise, and that's because A, they're in Alaska and there's nothing for about 4,000 miles in every direction. And B, well, of course, the car's electric. So if you turn the sound up on the video on Twitter, all you hear is, and it's kind of weird, deep breathing. Yeah, that's from the camera person. You know when it's it's particularly cold? Uh, it kind of makes you breathe a little bit harder. That's kind of what it sounds like. Although, if you watch the electric podcast, uh, as I like to do with uh, Fred and uh, Seth from Electric, then Seth's in Alaska right now, and it's uh, a t-shirt and shorts weather for some people there. Uh, Well, it's pretty silent, at least until the car drives past at speed, and then the Model 3 kicks up so much snow it hits the camera. Well, Fred at Electric has got more details on this new track mode, which the Model 3 is getting. Rather than removing traction control like other makers, so with other cars, you kind of turn off the traction control. With the Tesla, they do it slightly differently. In fact, they kind of add just different ways of using the motor. Uh, Well, Tesla explained that it uses the traction between the two motors. Of course, the performance is dual motor and slip distribution instead of brakes. That gives more control to the driver, they say. Though the traction control will still help in those real tougher situations, the regen braking not only acts differently when you're in track mode, uh, but it also has increased regen power, which uh, which helps give uh, a brake to the brakes, so to speak. Under track mode, Tesla also changed the powertrain cooling algorithm to be optimised for the higher power usage of a track day. I'll put a full link to that article and indeed the tweet from the main Tesla account in the show notes. Well, let's head to China and the sales once again just blow your socks off. When we talk about EV sales, they're often in hundreds or maybe thousands if we're lucky. Head to China and the sales of new energy vehicles are enormous. They leapt in July to 70, 70, 70,835 in one month alone. That's a 65% increase year on year. China are taking electric cars incredibly seriously. Well, in the first six months of the year, the cumulative sales of NEVs, the passenger vehicles, of course, what they call new energy vehicles, uh, they rose to 423,000 passenger vehicles. And that corresponds to a 111% rise year on year. All of this data, by the way, coming from a new press release from the China Passenger Car Association. So who's leading the way in China? Well, in July, it was BYD which took the honours and led the market with deliveries of 18,352 units for BYD alone. That's another stunning rise, up 63% year on year, July on July. And in terms of the total EV market, if you like, in China, that is a whopping 25.9% of the entire NEV market. Well, in total this year, BYD uh, got off to a slower start, but they've been increasing 90,239 models sold. So who was in second place? Well, in July, in second place was SAIC. Some of these names, right, if you haven't heard the podcast before, if you're not into the Chinese market, they'll all be strange names. In second place, SAIC. In third place, BAIC, BJEC. In fourth place, Geely. In fifth place, Cherry. Yeah, so if you're not into kind of the hardcore stats and facts about electric vehicles, some of those names won't mean anything. And uh, if you uh, if you look at those Chinese figures, they are making enormous numbers. Even the any of them in the top ten of the top EV sales over there, making huge amounts of electric cars. Well, new energy vehicle 
That's the umbrella term the Chinese use for electric vehicles. So when you break it down, uh, what's the split? Well, pure BEVs, pure battery electric vehicles, are 67% market share. Plug-ins taking the rest. Well, let's talk about trucks for a little while then. As electrification makes its way into the heavy-duty truck drive lines, integration of the truck's components is going to go even deeper than we say see in today's powertrains. That's according to Jason Morgan, who is writing for a Fleet Equipment magazine. Well, in an interview with the president of Eaton, his name is Jeff Lowinger, and he is the president of Eaton's recently established e-mobility business. He says this about electrifying those kind of vehicles that don't just do hundreds of thousands of miles, but eventually millions in their lifetimes, commercial vehicles. He says this, and I quote, any type of all-electric vehicle is like its own little grid. You're going to have different voltage demands on all-electric trucks. The highest is going to be to propel the vehicle from 600 to 900 volts, and then a lot of accessories will be operating at lower voltages at like 48 volts. There is no personal safety hazard for components running under 60 volts, so that provides better efficiency for the components. We believe that the transmission will be a key enabler of range and efficiency to meet customer needs, no matter what type of vehicle it is. We don't think direct drive will provide the needed efficiency and range, as well as performance. Think about the torque you need in certain profiles, he says. If the truck is on a hill, you need high torque capabilities, and you're not going to get that in a direct drive system. You're also not going to get the efficiency in other application profiles. A transmission provides the efficiency and operating performance torque-wise you need in a performance profile. End quote. Well, that's interesting because although most EVs, nearly all EVs that you buy as passenger vehicles are direct drive, there is uh, no transmission in them. Of course, you can, if you want to, have more than one gear in an EV. It's just that it's optimized for best acceleration and best top speed that you can get. And with EVs, it's it's optimized for acceleration. The top speed of many kind of road, average road going, I'm not talking track EVs, is in the low hundreds of miles an hour, and that is all of the fast you need. There's nothing stopping EVs, of course, having a gearbox. And here is the president of Eaton saying, you know what, with commercial vehicles, we think it's going to be a necessity. Well, I'll finish off his quote. He says, this is now, sorry, and he says, the time is now to start. There's a lot of activity going on within electrification. You're not late, but you're not early. There's a lot of opportunity to take advantages of technologies that will help you meet new regulations in the 2024 time frame. I'll put a link to that article in the show notes if you like to look at the kind of commercial vehicle side of things. Well, speaking of trucks, an update on the Tesla Semi, which I picked up from Teslarati, and I saw a few people tweeting about this online as well. Uh, inspectors at the California Highway Patrol Commercial Truck Inspection Station were in for a bit of a treat last Friday afternoon, August the 10th, when a spotless, is how they described it, spotless Tesla Semi, uh, pulling a trailer full of cargo, made its way through the inspection centre. It's located just off of Interstate 80, about 50 miles south of Tesla's Gigafactory, uh, where the all-electric big rig was coming from. Well, CHP authorities stopped the Tesla Semi for an impromptu inspection of part of its authority under the vehicle code to stop and inspect trucks where signs are posted. And I wonder, uh, that's the end of the Tesla Rati article, by the way, uh, I wonder whether they have to pull in every... 20, 30, 100th truck that goes past? Or do they have the discretion to go, here comes one of those new Teslas. Let's have a look at it. I mean, you would, even if you have to pull in every 200th truck that drives past your inspection centre and you're meant to do it all to the book. If you're at truck 195 and you see the Tesla coming, you'd be like, right, you're number 200, in you come sunshine. Let's have a look at your truck. Let's make sure it's okay. Uh, by the way, pass with flying colours, I should add. Uh, spotless is how they described it. I should hope so too. And uh, fascinating that they even took a few pictures and posted them online. I don't think Tesla would mind too much. Uh, there are only external pictures that they were posting on their social pages. That's interesting that inspection centres on highways even have their own social pages these days. Does anybody not have one? Well, talking about using electric cars to shuttle people between cities, the Canadian startup Inorbis 
has been a recent recipient of a wonderful Clean Technica article. Uh, they transport travellers between Calgary and Edmonton using Model S and Model Xs, echoing the business models of similar startups. Testloop, I guess, is probably the poster child of these ones. Also, Tesla Shuttle, and there's more around the world as well. The company was founded by Rosario Fotongo, who answered questions for T Clean Technica. Well, here's some of the details that uh, I've picked out that I thought were more interesting. Uh, they say we have eight Teslas in service right now between Calgary and Edmonton. Hopefully, they want a dozen by the end of the year. Well, they're putting some business Teslas away. Uh, we're building a network of solar-powered charging stations that will offer public charging access. We're also looking into the possibility of creating our own uh, supercharger stations if Tesla is willing to partner with businesses to create them. Well, you can check out that Clean Technica article. There's a link to Jake Richardson's article in the show notes. Fascinating that another company is choosing Tesla to do the uh, whole kind of uh, ride sharing and shuttle, uh, things like that. It's no mention in the article of using the Teslas because of the supercharging network. Tesla Loop have been very open to say because they get free supercharging, it makes their business model incredibly attractive because they can supercharge for free and then your running costs are incredibly low. I want to say hi to a few new Patreon supporters over the last 24 hours. Thank you so much. And a couple of names that I hope I get correct. And by the way, it's something that I think is one of those things that you should be respectful of everybody's name. So if you wonder why I have a stress about saying their name correctly, it's just I, I think that and your, your name is the most incredibly personal thing to you. And it would be sucky for someone to say it wrong. Uh, so Cesar Trujillo or Cesar Trujillo or Cesar Trujillo? Hey, I'm so sorry. I'm just butchering your name. Cesar or Cesar, thank you very much for your support at a partner level of the podcast. Mark Buckingham has joined as a podcast producer. John Nodal has offered his support as well on Patreon. Daniel Milford is a new producer of the podcast. Hello, Daniel Milford. Thank you very much. And Paul Seeger Smith, a new executive producer of the podcast. Paul Seeger Smith, thank you so much for your support and along with all of the Patreon supporters, uh, they bring you this podcast. Well, having a look at some of the community comments that I've not got to the last couple of days, by the way, for just one or two reasons, but some excellent comments uh, that have been flying into the podcast. My old mate Beardy, uh, Beardy McBeardface, has been talking about why some people would buy the Leaf and some people would buy the Model 3, and why the Leaf sales perhaps aren't going up in North America, uh, how they might should be. Uh, well, he says it's the Model 3 that's holding back the leaf, in his opinion, in the US. He says, I think most EV lovers aspire to a Tesla. I know I do, and my friends do. So you can get a Tesla for a little more than a Leaf. What would you do? Don't get me wrong, the Leaf is a fab car, says Beardy. Uh, battery issues aside. Yeah, don't mention rapid charging. Uh, when I drove one the other week, I really liked it, but... It's not a Tesla. Uh, if you wanted an iPace with similar spec to a Model X, like self-leveling suspension, you end up paying about the same. The cheapest Jag looks a lot uh, of the refinements. Uh, lacks, sorry, the cheapest Jag lacks a lot of the refinement and toys of the X. Uh, sorry, I've not been commenting recently, but keep up the great work. Well, David Hutton Potts has been talking uh, about uh, why. On this podcast, you don't often hear uh, commercial vehicles being mentioned. On the basis that you are called EV News, will you be giving any coverage to emerging manufacturing of all electric commercial vehicles? Well, David, thank you very much for your comment. It doesn't get as much because the cars tend to be the ones that get all the headlines. But if you go back a few weeks, I did an interview with Teva Motors, T-E-V-V-A, Teva Motors here in the UK, whose theory for electrified commercial vehicles is that you have a big battery, but also put in a range extender as well. So that gets rid of all of the arguments about running out of range, but it means that nearly all applications are done on battery, but the range extender is there as an emergency backup. It's a whole probably half-hour interview with Teva uh, about uh, commercial vehicles and the challenges and the opportunities. I would recommend you go check that out if you too are interested in that kind of thing. 
Well, hi to Duncan. Duncan Drake says, what happened to the Hyundai and the Kia in your EV lineup yesterday? Well, on yesterday's podcast, by the way, if you haven't heard it, you can always download any of the previous podcasts. Uh, I was talking about, well, specifically, I was talking about as Tesla's competition increases, who are the ones that could give them the most headaches? So we were covering off. I won't. Yeah, won't spoil the whole thing if you are going to download yesterday's, but things like the Jaguar I-Pace, the Audi e-tron Quattro, the Mercedes EQC, the Porsche Ty- Porsche Taycan, Porsche Taycan, and uh, I probably didn't explain well enough in the setup to that story. I was specifically talking about cars that could give Tesla a headache. With the average selling price of a Tesla, I don't know what I don't know what it is. The average selling price of a Model Three, uh, I don't think they've ever said. I would guess. The average selling price, well, let's tot up a Model 3. $64,000 base price for the performance, so dual motor performance. Then you're going to want to add the performance pack, and that'll get you towards 70. Or if you don't add that, you'll want to add enhanced autopilot. That'll get you towards 70. Probably want a different paint color as well. So, you know, on average, I would guesstimate $70,000 is the average selling price of a Tesla Model 3 performance. So that's why, at the moment, because $35,000 Model 3 isn't on sale till Q1 next year, that's why I didn't talk about those cars being competitors to uh, Tesla at the moment. The Hyundai Kona, fabulous car, great mileage. And the same for the Kia Nero EV as well. In the long range, 64 kilowatt hour battery, loads of mileage, loads of tech. Not the most modern looking inside. I like the look. It suits my personal taste. Lots of buttons and things. I understand how some people are very excited about the minimalistic look of the Model 3. So that's why I didn't mention them in that article. I hope that makes I hope it makes sense. Well, Andrew Hawkins has been talking about why the 40 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf isn't selling as well in America as it is in Europe. He says 40 kilowatt hours is always bound to be less popular in the US. They're waiting for the 60 kilowatt hour or waiting for the Hyundai Kona. Yeah, I guess once we it was public that the Nissan Leaf was going to get a longer 60 kilowatt hour battery as a 2019 model year. So that would imply being on sale sometime this year and delivery starting end of this year, beginning of next year. Once we knew that, there was no hurry to buy the 40 kilowatt hour. If you can wait because you get a bigger battery, you get battery cooling, so no rapid gate issues, and then maybe you're happy to wait. Or you want to go for the Hyundai or the Kia. Or maybe just in the US where distances can be a little bit longer, a little bit more spread out. You just didn't want a 40 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. Good comment, Andrew. And the final comment from Philip Allen. We were talking earlier this uh, last weekend on the podcast about BMW's progress and the various, the, well, the new architecture which they'll build their EVs on. He says it's unfair to miss out mentioning the i3 and the i8. Uh, Did I? Yeah. I I might have mentioned the i3, I think, actually. I miss out the i8 because it's super expensive and a hybrid, and so it's it's not exactly mass market. The i3, though, I thought I would have mentioned that, but if I didn't, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a bit unfair to miss those two out. Uh, Philip says this, and I agree, neither of these are in the Model 3 or 3 Series segment. Maybe BMW should focus on cost effectiveness with the launch of their 3 Series EV, and then release an out-and-out M3 version of the 3 Series later. On a separate issue, the design of the Mercedes EQC. So I was talking about this, about how the design of the EQC Mercedes is exactly the same as a combustion version of the car. They're not redesigning it from a blank sheet of paper. He says, I think it allows for both EV and combustion technology under the bonnet, the hood. Uh, A big technical design compromise, in my view... He says, maybe based upon views within Mercedes on the rate of EV progress, i.e. less optimistic than Jaguar. And I get what Philip's saying there, so that if the rate of EV takeoff is slower and then they haven't got to retool whole factories because the Mercedes factories are designed with their EVs to put in the drivetrain that is relevant. So the same factory will get the car coming along the production line, they'll slot in uh, the electric drivetrain or they'll slot in a diesel engine. Now, that's probably hedging their bets a bit, and I wonder how much it might slow down production. I don't know, but Philip's got a great comment there. You can do the same thing on the YouTube comments or the Facebook comments, and thank you very much for everybody else who has left a comment. I would just say, by the way, just on a note, that always it continues to impress and surprise me that the level of comment and debate on this community 
is always really respectful. And when I see people disagreeing with each other, they say, oh, look, it's only my opinion, but I think this. I don't see any shouty, angry, crazy, bonkers people putting comments on on uh, our YouTube and on our Facebook comment sections, unlike like literally the rest of the whole internet. So I don't know what it is about you and your fellow EV News Daily listeners, but you're a, you're, a, you're a class above them when it comes to the comments. Thank you so much for your continued politeness. Well, if you want to listen to any of the previous podcasts, all 209 of them are online right now. I put them on places like iTunes and uh, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, and, of course, the WordPress blog, which has had a mini makeover over the weekend, just a mini one, at evnewsdaily.com. Remember, if you subscribe on any of those places, you get them first and free and automatically. If... Uh, I, I want to thank all of the Patreon supporters. As always, patreon.com forward slash EV News Daily. It really isn't essential, by the way. Totally optional. And don't feel obliged to ever uh, feel that you need to chip in $1, $3, $5, 10 well, you know, 50 uh, which some of the tiers go up to for the sort of extra benefits and stuff. What would really mean so much to me is sharing this podcast which you can do for free with somebody who you know who might be interested. In the meantime, find us on the socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.